The Bible Treasury, New Series. N7. A monthly magazine of papers on scriptural subjects. Volume 27, Article 34, 1908 and 1909. Part 18 of 46. Studies in the Gospel of Mark. By W. J. Hawking. 18. Obedience the test of relationship. And there come his mother and his brethren, see note 1, and, standing without, they sent unto him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting about him, see note 2, and they say unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren, see note 1, without seek for thee. And he answered them, and saith, Who is my mother and my brethren? And looking round on them which sat round about him, he saith, See note 3, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and sister and mother, Mark 3 verses 31 to 35, Revised Version. Note 1. His brethren and his mother, John Nelson Darby as the authorized version. Note 2. A crowd sat around him, John Nelson Darby. Note 3. Looking around in a circuit at those that were sitting around him, he says, John Nelson Darby. End of notes. The kinsfolk of Jesus had set out for Capernaum with the intention of restraining him in his active service by word and work, verse 21. They arrived after the interview in the house between Jesus and the scribes from Jerusalem had taken place. On account of the multitude, his mother and his brethren were unable to obtain access to him, and they accordingly sent a message to announce that they were seeking him. They must have known that scribes, to whom naturally some reverence and regard were due as teachers of the law of Moses, were among the audience. But this they disregard and send their peremptory message as if to assert the paramount claims upon Jesus of natural ties. But the servant of Jehovah, in that wisdom which had come from above, turned the occasion to account in his preaching of the kingdom of God. He did not meet with an angry rebuff this unwarrantable interference which sprang from natural affection, although it was ignorant affection, blind to his heavenly mission. But the Lord used the incident as a text, so to speak, for the announcement of the fundamental principle of the kingdom which was at hand. The effort made by his kindred to influence him led him to declare that obedience to the will of God is the only reliable foundation of divine relationship, while it necessarily takes precedence of every other claim. Looking round on them which sat round about him, he saith, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Looking round, parable po, is a characteristic expression of Mark, and is only used once by any other New Testament writer, Luke 6 verse 10. By Mark, it is used six times, and on all but one occasion it has reference to the Lord himself, Mark 3 verses 5 and 34, Mark 5 verse 32, Mark 10 verse 23, Mark 11 verse 11. In the remaining instance, it is applied to the disciples, 9 verse 8. The term seems here to imply the intense personal and individual interest the Lord took in those who sat around him in the attitude of discipleship. Jesus himself doing God's will. This simple and profound saying of the Lord, verse 35, embodied truth applicable to man from the beginning. For obedience to the will of God must ever be inseparable from man's well-being and happiness. Historically, the will of God forbade eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and disobedience to that expressed will involve the forfeiture of the bliss of Eden and the inheritance of a world of sorrow and sin. Of Adam's descendants, whether enlightened Jews or darkened Gentiles, it is written comprehensively, not of a particular era, but of every age, they have all turned aside, they are together become unprofitable, there is none that doeth good, no, not so much as one. So that disobedience to God is declared to be perpetuated among men, his will being universally slighted and despised. Now the Lord Jesus came not only to recall man by his instructions to a sense of his individual responsibility to God as the moral governor of the world but to afford in himself an instance of perfect human obedience to the will of God. He came as a man truly, but also as the incarnate servant of Jehovah, 
which no man beside him was or could be. Upon every sentient creature service to God is not a matter of choice but of incumbency, but upon the Son, there was no obligation of servitude. He chose to take upon himself the form of a servant. This he purposed to do before the world was, as was intimated by the prophetic spirit through the psalmist, then said I, Lo, I am come, in the roll of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yeah, thy law is within my heart, Psalm 40 verses 7 and 8. This utterance is definitely declared in the epistle of the Hebrews to have been fulfilled by the coming of Christ, Hebrews 10 verses 5 and 9. In him, the will of God was done in this world, where the will of man was and is ever struggling for supremacy. And no gospel sets forth with greater precision than the fourth, that which portrays him especially as the Son of God, his absorbing devotion to the will of God. After his ministry of the water of life to the woman at the well of Sichar, he said to his disciples, I have meat to eat that ye know nothing my meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to accomplish his work, John 4 verses 32 and 34. Again, testifying to the Jews of himself as the appointed judge of living and dead, he said, I seek not mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, John 5 verse 30. And once again, he declared, I am come down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, going on to make known what is that will with regard to those who come to him, and this is the will of him that sent me, that of all that which he hath given me I should lose nothing but should raise it up at the last day. For this is the will of my Father that every one that beholdeth the Son, and believeth on him, should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day, John 6 verses 38 to 40. What subjection was this? In the matter of receiving poor vile sinners, loving them as he did, about to die for them as he was, he acknowledged that he could not cast them out because it was the Father's will that they should come to him and receive eternal life. In his joy, as in his suffering, he was the submissive one, in all the worthy object of our admiring and adoring wonder and worship. But, moreover, we have been permitted to see how his submission was subjected to the most rigorous of all tests. Three only of the apostles were allowed to accompany the Lord in his vigil in Gethsemane. But sleep overcame these so that there were no human witnesses of that agony of the holy servant. Yet we have the record of the prayers and supplications, the strong crying and tears, the bloody sweat, the threefold repetition, communicated to us in the Gospels as well as by allusion in Hebrews 5 verse 7. As a son, he learned obedience, and his obedience was unto death. In the garden, the consummation of that obedience in atoning sufferings and death was immediately before him. He anticipated the cup that his father had given him to drink. He gauged its bitterness with absolute perfection. He measured the immeasurable burden of guilt to be laid upon him. The sting of death as for none else was before his spirit. It was in the anticipative realization of all this and of much besides, that he fell prostrate and prayed, O oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. In this perfect resignation, we have the triumph of holy obedience. Thy will be done was soon followed by it is finished, and the will of God was indeed done. That obedience was thereby accomplished through which many were made righteous. Doing God's will the basis of relationship. The religious trust of the Jews was in their pedigree. They boasted that they were lineal descendants of Abraham, John 8 verses 33 and 39, an idol that John the Baptist sought to hew to pieces with fierce invective, think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham, Matthew 3 verse 9. The Lord here declared that in the kingdom of God vital relationship with the king was demonstrated not by nationality, but by personal obedience and individual fealty. The mass were obdurate and irresponsive to the Lord's teaching, but whoever separated himself from the disobedient nation proclaimed himself thereby on the Lord's side. It will be remembered that Israel as a nation placed themselves at the beginning upon the ground of obedience, and it was because they proved themselves in this relationship to be a disobedient and gainsaying people that they were set aside. 
Jehovah said to them through Moses, If ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me from among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. In their self-ignorance and self-satisfaction, they readily accepted this condition, all the people answered together, and said, All that the Lord hath spoken we will do, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 8, Exodus 24 verse 3. Thus it came about that at the people's desire the law was imposed with its defined responsibilities of unqualified love to God and man, its conditions being summed up in the phrase, This do, and thou shalt live. But the recorded history of Israel under the law is one of dismal failure. Like sheep, they all went astray and turned every one to his own way. They were the sons of disobedience. In the concluding words of the book of Judges, every man did what was right in his own eyes. John the Baptist was sent to prepare the way of the Lord by turning the hearts of the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. For Messiah's kingdom, as the Lord here intimated, is characterized by doing the will of God. For this consummation, the Lord taught his disciples to pray to their Father in heaven, a new title of God evidently contrasted with that of Abraham their father on earth as to the flesh. The Lord had come to set up the promised kingdom, and he instructed his followers to pray to him whose it was, Thine is the kingdom, for its due establishment so that the will of the Father might be done on earth even as in heaven, Matthew 6 verses 9 to 13. On high there is the harmony of perfect desire among the angelic hosts to do the divine pleasure, as it is written in a psalm of praise, Bless the Lord, yet his angels that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his that do his pleasure, Psalm 8 verses 20 and 21. And in Messiah's kingdom, this spirit of obedience to the divine will shall also be seen below. When it comes about that Jehovah's anointed rules in the midst of his enemies his people shall be willing in that day of power, Psalm 110 verse 3. Enough has now been written to show what a far-reaching principle obedience to the will of God is. And it is as essential in the present as in the past and in the future. Relationship to God is inseparable from subjection to his will. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And the Lord said, If ye love me, ye will keep my commandments. Recipients as we are of his illimitable grace, we may not ignore his authority, but are called to do the will of God from the heart soul, Ephesians 6 verse 6. And to quote again the Master's words, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, Matthew 7 verse 21. This is the divine purpose with regard to us, who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience, 1 Peter 1 verse 2. And the impulse of the new nature begotten of God within us is to cry with the psalmist, Teach me to thy will, O God, Psalm 143 verse 10. So Saul of Tarsus, convicted in the dust, exclaimed, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do, nor was he disobedient to the heavenly vision. It may be asked, how can I ascertain the will of God? First of all there must in such a case be the willing mind. This the Lord himself declared, If anyone willeth to do his will he shall know of the teaching whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself, John 6 verse 17. Coming to the scriptures with the prayer, already quoted, of the psalmist, Teach me to do thy will, O God, Psalm 143 verse 10, the docile spirit is instructed, so that he may stand perfect and fully assured in all that will, Colossians 4 verse 12. The Apostle Paul desired on behalf of the saints at Coloss that they might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, Colossians 1 verse 9. There is first the hearing and then the doing. In the Lord's words, My mother and my brethren are those which hear the word of God and do it, Luke 8 verse 21. But while to understand what the will of the Lord is, Ephesians 5 verse 17, is obviously essential, it is required further in order to prove that good, acceptable, and perfect will, that we present our bodies a living sacrifice, 
not fashioning ourselves according to this present evil age, Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Self-denial and suffering are mostly involved in doing the will of God, as Peter reminds us, 1 Peter 3 verse 17, 1 Peter 4 verse 19, 1 Peter 2 verse 15. The obedience of Christ was of this nature, and we also are to have that mind, as is exhorted in the verses which speak of his great renunciation unto the death of the cross, Philippians 2 verses 5 to 8. It is important to mark this since the Incarnation is an insoluble enigma apart from the fact that the Son was here in human guise to do the Father's will. Though he were a Son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered, Hebrews 5 verse 8. As God, he was essentially exempt from the responsibilities of the creature. These he assumed that as the second man he might become the federal head of a new creation which should be characterized by obedience, even as the first creation was by disobedience, see Romans 5 verses 12 to 19. Until the Father's kingdom is fully established, and a spirit of unvarying obedience to his will pervades the whole earth, obedience to his word by the minority must be attended, by the renunciation of selfish interests and by the persecuting opposition of the disobedient ones. But the faithful Christ will publicly confess as akin to himself, who came to do and suffer the will of God. His obedience had a double character, an active and a passive side, the doing and the suffering. In our case, the will of God involves, on the one hand, the active and diligent performance of assigned tasks, and on the other hand, the patient endurance of privation and suffering for the sake of righteousness and the name of Christ. Thus we do, Poyo, the will of God from the heart, and we also say in the spirit of the Lord himself, Thy will be done, Genome, Matthew 26 verses 39 and 42, Acts 21 verse 14. However, in spite of the world's fierce enmity and powerful antagonism, the obedient believer is the only stable person in the world. The world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever, 1 John 2 verse 17. The Lord taught this same truth by a parable concerning the obedient disciple, Whosoever heareth these words of mine and doeth them shall be likened unto a wise man, which built his house upon the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And every one that heareth these words of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man, which built his house upon the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and smote upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof, Matthew 7 verses 24 and 27. Though there may be temporary defeat, there will be an eternal victory for the obedient. Whoso suffers with Christ shall also reign with him. The Lord then, in these weighty words, indicated what was before Israel after the flesh, who boasted in the possession of the law but forgot that not the hearers of the law are just before God, but that the doers of the law shall be justified, Romans 2 verse 13. As the servant of Jehovah, he acknowledges as his associates those who follow him in the pathway of obedience to the will, Thelema, of God, which is that which God decides to have done because it is pleasing to him. God's good pleasure is everywhere in scripture regarded as the law whereby all things, human and divine, are ordered. Christ is regarded as its embodiment and manifestation, and the Christian, being, by profession at least, one with Christ, is supposed to be conformed to that will in all things. And regarding this incident in its connection with what precedes it, we believe that in the words he used we have not so much his absolute renunciation of natural relationship as his enunciation of obedience to the will of God as the only valid basis of spiritual relationship with him. Thus we take the yoke of Christ upon us and learn to love, to do, and to suffer the will of God. O will, that willest good alone. Lead thou the way, thou guidest best. A silent child, I follow on. And trusting, lean upon thy breast.